in that way. Oh, oh sorry, I was. That's okay. I beat oh. you out. <laughs> no worries. And then I'll put my video off and let people in. Okie doke. Spencer, I've just noticed that I can't see the chat the way my screen is. Um, yeah. So what I'll do is look at the comments at the end. Yeah, that's fine. What what I generally do um, is at the end, Tom. We I'll just read the questions from the chat. Okay. I'll read that you the help. questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'll read you the questions and you can answer in the chat. And yeah, some, great. Pe some people prefer to um, uh, ask by switching on their camera, etc. Um, but if not, then I'll just read you those. Um, those questions perfect where was your where was your where was your open water swim is it in the lake or river just a local lake near me actually yeah um in rounded park so i don't know okay. if you saw the triathlon a couple of weeks ago the sort of the elite triathlon that was on tv yeah so okay. the same lake as they swim in okay yeah we have to be a little bit um a little bit naughty get down there early before the park ranger comes on duty so it's an early start six o'clock in the lake but oh wow cool nice way to start the day yeah yeah absolutely so what we'll do, Tom, we'll just leave it for another couple of minutes and allow, allow people to um, dash in and we'll start about three o'clock. Yeah, it makes sense. It's about time of day, isn't it? People are sort of coming across from other meetings. Yeah, cool. I noticed that one of the Brownie brothers didn't make the Olympic team, did he? No, he didn't. He's not had a very good season, really. I mean, he's had a few injuries in yeah. the last year or two, so he went into the race with an injury. Yeah. Um, the GB team were already struggling to get a, a third Um place in the men's yeah. olympic team they didn't manage to get it because yeah. they were outside the position so it was always going to be difficult for alistair to get that second slot he would have made it if they got the third slot but yeah as it happens he's, he's injured anyway so i think he's he's ended his season he said he's having a yeah an operation on his ankle yeah which is a bit of a shame obviously for him double olympic champion he would have been hoping to go to go and compete again i don't think he would have been in shape yeah you have done well but just that experience of going back and yeah, he's a he's a real competitor. No one else. Yeah. He lives about sort of five miles from where I do, so I see him out quite a bit. I've ridden okay, with him cool. in the past. Yeah, yeah, cool. That sounds cool. Okay, Tom, I'll um I'll introduce you now then. So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Send Seminar Series. My name is Spencer Hayes. I'm one of the Send team, and I'm uh, delighted to introduce one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Tom and who's a senior lecturer at the School of Education at Leeds Beckett University up in Yorkshire. He teaches across primary education, uh, specifically on the QTS programme, predominantly delivering the physical education content and is course leader for the Childhood Studies and Early Years Master's course. Prior to moving to Leeds, uh, Tom completed his PhD working with the Youth Sport Trust to develop a fundamental movement skills assessment tool for teachers. He has also taught in primary and secondary school settings for a number of years before moving into academia. Tom recently co-founded a collaborative research group called the Research and Innovation Hub for Physical Educators and Their Pupils um, through interdisciplinary um, academics and teachers to support the needs of learners and to ensure that children are given the best opportunity to achieve optimal physical and mental well-being through PE and sport. Um, Thanks very much for the time this afternoon, Tom, and I'll pass you over to the SEM guys, okay? Thank you a lot. Lovely, great. Thank you, Spencer, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'd just like to say, actually, um, Spencer was involved um, for a lot of my PhD study um, as, and was influential in a lot of the research that I'll be talking about um, today. So within that introduction, Spencer's mentioned that my PhD was working with the Youth Sport Trust to develop a teacher-oriented fundamental movement skills assessment tool. Now that's something that I'm gonna focus a lot of my presentation on this afternoon and talk to you about um, some of the background and the importance of teachers being focused on developing children, children's fundamental movement skills um, and the need for teachers to be assessing children's movement more within primary schools. And we'll look at some of the, um, the wider Im impact and benefits that could have on children's um, health and wellbeing. Um, I'll also talk around some of the, the stages of that development process um, in a way that um, I'd really like to encourage um, academics to work more with teachers and sort of bridging that gap between what we do as academics and researchers um, and what's happening in schools and um, settings where children um, are learning. 
to try and improve um, the, um, the, the interventions that are in place, better support those teachers and practitioners who are working with children, using our research informed perspectives um, and being guided by teachers to understand how they are working in those settings um, and what we can do to work with them to develop these, these interventions. So that's something I'll return to towards the end um, of my presentation today. Like I said, um, my PhD was supported and funded by the Youth Support Trust. So I just want to say a thank you um, for their um, input within this research as well. Um, and really what we set out to do was to develop a fundamental movement skills assessment tool for teachers. Um, and we really wanted to sort of capture um, the needs of teachers within that process. So I just want to begin by sort of laying some um, foundation of knowledge um, and understanding of what fundamental movement skills are. Uh, now, I'm sorry if some of this is um, a little bit basic for some of you. I know that we're all coming from different um, areas of expertise and background. So apologies um, if I'm sort of um, covering something you already know. Um, throughout the presentation, I do understand we've all got different experiences. Um, mine's from a more educational background. Um, so I'll, maybe I'm going to sort of pitch it in the middle um, of where I think people are going to land with their um, understanding and knowledge of these concepts. If you do have any questions um, or comments, please do use the chat function. Um, I can't pick these up while I'm speaking, but Spence is going to help me out at the end where I'll um, address some of those questions, which I'm hoping to leave some time to do so. So fundamental movement skills. Um, I'm using the term defined by David Gallagher, um, and they're um, composed of three subgroups of stability, object control, and locomotion. Now, fundamental movement skills are really the foundation of more complex and specialized movement patterns that are developed um, and are used within organized and non-organized games and sports. So there's a real demand on children who are going to be physically active in childhood and adolescence to develop fundamental movement skills. So some examples um, of these, um, so basic skills of locomotion would be running, um, hopping, jumping, sidestepping, galloping. So these aren't developed necessarily in sport specific settings, but children learn and practice, children learn and practice these skills um, through a wide range um, of organized and non-organized games. So a lot of my work is, again, um, based around Gallagher's um, model of movement development. So I've used the hourglass model here to represent sort of the phases and stages of children's movement development. And I think what's really important to emphasize here is that children's movement is age related, but it's not age dependent. OK, so Gallagher um, proposed in his hourglass model that the fundamental movement phase is really around the age period for children of three to seven years old, and that they have the physical and cognitive abilities to be competent of, to, and to have mastered fundamental movement skills by the age of seven years old. However, the research shows, um, and this is global research, um, that children aren't achieving mastery in fundamental movement skills by the age of seven. In actual fact, it's more concerning than that. A lot of children up to the age of 10, 11, 12, 13 aren't mastering fundamental movement skills. I'll address why that might be such a problem um, in, a, in a few slides time, but just to bear that in mind that this idea that um, it's not age dependent, um, but it is age related. Um, and this idea that children actually um, develop fundamental movement skills through a developmental process and um, developmental phases. So again, Gallagher talked about the stages of development um, within the fundamental movement phase being an initial an elementary and a mature stage. So even within those movements, we can still capture um, different levels of competence of how children are performing um, those movements, whether that be running, throwing, jumping or catching. Based upon this model as well, as we can see, once children have mastered fundamental movement skills, they can then then able to progress to that specialized movement phase. And that's where we see children maybe start to combine movement skills. So can they um, catch and throw a ball whilst running? So that's where they're starting to apply these um, fundamental movement skills within more um, sport specific 
um, settings where those movements become more complex and more technical. So the barrier there is for those children who don't develop fundamental movement skills um, and have um, competence, competency in performing those skills, then they're unable to progress to that specialised movement phase and their participation in more specialised sports might be inhibited. So as we can see from the examples um, here on the slides, so the real importance of fundamental movement skills and the need for children to develop these skills in early childhood, because if a child can balance, then they have the opportunity to take part in a much wider range of sports and games as they get older. So if we look at the example of balance, so we've got the young girl there walking along a balance beam. Okay, so dynamic balance, um, maintaining balance whilst moving. So for that child who is able to do that competently in early childhood, then as she gets older, those range of opportunities to experience um, different activities become available to her, okay? So we're not just thinking within gymnastics now, we're thinking of going skateboarding or surfing um, or fencing, okay? Fencing itself involves dynamic balance as you're moving forward and backwards towards your opponent or defending. Okay, so there's elements of balance within those activities. If we look at that on reverse side, so not if you can, but if you can't do one of these movements, then what happens? For that child who can't catch the ball, then as they go through their life at school, through childhood into adolescence, then if they haven't learned that fundamental movement skill of being able to catch a ball, then when they maybe move to secondary school, where PE is typically... Um, delivered around traditional sports and games, so basketball, netball, cricket, then if they haven't learned how to catch a ball, then they're gonna have be inhibited in playing those sports, okay? They haven't developed the movement competence, they haven't got the confidence, which is also really important to take part. So if they aren't able to make, to sort of use the basic skills within the game, then how are they then able to establish the more advanced te techniques and tactics involved of attacking and, and um, defending with that ball within those games. So their participation is really inhibited, okay? So there's a real importance there of developing fundamental movement skills within that early childhood. So starting in the early years of primary school at four years old. So another model that I want to share with you as well, um, this is sort of widely reported in um, Stodden and colleagues in 2008 proposed a conceptual model of a relationship between motor competence. Motor competence, um, for the purpose of this, um, relates to fundamental movement skills. So those terms I um, used, um, sort of they're both connected, used inter interchangeably. Okay, so Stodden um, presented this model whereby children with greater motor competence are more physically active in middle and later childhood. And as we can see, sort of a positive spiral going up towards the top of the right of the model. So those children who have got greater motor competence or have better developed fundamental uh, movement skills, they're more physically active. They have an, a reduced risk of obesity. They have better health metrics, okay, greater cardiorespiratory fitness, um, better um, or healthier weight status. There's real positive um, implications there of developing motor competence, fundamental movement skills in that early and middle um, period of childhood. And again, if we look at what could go wrong and the opposite side of that, then if children don't develop that fundamental movement skills, proficiency or that motor competence within childhood, then they're less physically active. They have reduced health-related fitness. There's a greater risk of obesity, um, plus the other health-related illnesses that could be connected with that. So looking beyond Stodden's model um, of fundamental movement skills and physical activity, there are other factors as well um, that fundamental movement skills competence, competency can influence. So looking at the research over the last few years, um, there's, been, there's um, been shown to be a positive relationship between fundamental movement skills competence and cardiorespiratory fitness, healthier weight status in children. Now this is 
publish research in the UK um, and internationally. There's also been um, some pockets of research that have shown positive relationships between fundamental movement skills competence and cognitive function and academic achievement. That was done in um, a couple of studies with children in the early years of secondary school. So we're talking sort of children who are 11, 12 and 13. Um, and there was a significant relationship there with those children who had um, greater fundamental movement skills competence had a higher academic attainment in the following year. There's also been evidence to show that children with greater fundamental movement skills competence have a higher level of physical self-efficacy as well. So it's not only their physical health um, which improve, but also their mental well-being as well. So my work to provide a fundamental movement skills assessment for teachers, we saw that as crucial to work with teachers and to develop children's movement skills in a school setting. Because um, I, I saw this bit of data quite recently, and I thought that was um, really significant that children spend around 40% of their waking day in the school setting throughout the academic year. Now that just highlights the significant um, role the school environment can have for children to develop um, movement skills. So what that needs is teachers who are knowledgeable and well prepared to help children develop and practice their fundamental movement skills. This also follows on from a systematic review in the early um, 2000s, it was 2013. Um, again, a systematic review is international coverage and that highlighted the, um, the importance of teachers to be involved um, and the, how, how important the school setting is to help children develop fundamental movement skills. So why is there a need for a teacher-oriented movement assessment tool? So first of all, the national curriculum, um, the PE national curriculum for primary school, key stage one and key stage two, um, highlights the need for children to develop basic movement skills, throwing, running, jumping, catching, etc. As I've said before, these are the fundamental movement skills. Then in 2015, there was a report conducted by colleagues that um, it was a study with um, teachers across the United Kingdom, and the teachers highlighted that they needed um, an assessment or a resource to help them assess children's movement skills so they could better understand the competency of the children. By having that better understanding of their competencies, they could then, that will then be able to use it to inform their teaching to, be, to help children to become more competent movers. So we're not proposing that this is the first or only assessment for, um, for measuring children's fundamental movement skills. Historically, there are a wide number of assessments to measure children's um, movement skills or motor competence. Okay, so the test of gross motor development um, and the BOT2, Brunetsky's or Ozarecki test of motor proficiency. These are two very widely known assessments used to measure children's motor competence. Now, the, there are some difficulties with these assessments. They were typically developed for um, clinical settings for health um, professionals to use to measure children's movement deficiencies. Okay, so it wasn't, they weren't designed for teachers. They weren't designed for, for the use in a specific setting of being used in a school with a group of 30 children when you've got a whole class in. They weren't designed for teachers who aren't health professionals. Some of our teachers delivering PE in primary schools aren't experts in PE. It's widely reported in the literature that teachers or some teachers of PE in primary schools feel unprepared to deliver PE. They need more support to help develop their professional knowledge and understanding of the subject. So these um, assessments that were developed for professionals with that specialist knowledge maybe aren't suitable for use by, for use by teachers. So some of the differences in the existing movement assessment tools are the way the scoring is conducted. So there's two examples here. So we have product oriented assessment. Now, if anyone's used the bot two before, um, that's an example of product oriented scoring. OK, so product oriented scoring is a fairly simple way um, to capture children's movement. OK, so 
if we were to assess a child who's um, catching a ball, we want to understand their level of ability, of ability to do that. So if we um, pass the ball five times to the child and we record how many times they catch that ball, well, that's product oriented scoring. OK, if the child catches it five times, we can tick them off. We can comp we can confidently say that they've got good ability to catch. If that child only catches the ball once, then we can confidently say that they're not very, um, they haven't got great ability, they're not very able to catch the ball. Okay, that's product-oriented scoring. Process-oriented scoring looks at it in a different way. So this captures how the, the movement is performed. So the test of gross motor development is an example of an assessment using process-oriented scoring. So of the 12 skills within that assessment, that have criteria of how that movement is performed. So if we look at the catch, for example, if we are wanting to assess how the, the child catches the ball, we're looking at observable behaviors in the way they catch the ball. For example, does, the, um, does their head or eyes stay focused on the ball while it's in flight? Do their hands move to the ball whilst it's in flight? By identifying, how they're moving in relation to those criteria, it not only tells us um, their level of competency. So if we can tick off it, yes, their eyes do stay focused on the ball. Yes, their hands do um, move towards the ball in the air. Then again, they're a competent catcher um, based upon that assessment. If the child doesn't meet those criteria, then for the assessor or the teacher, it then gives them the information needed to help address what that child is isn't doing correctly within that skill. So there's a greater level of information provided to the assessor to help understand how that child moves, okay? So I'm gonna return a little bit later on about product and pro process oriented scoring. I just think that little bit of um, context will help on a later slide. So the next period of my presentation, I want to talk you through um, the different stages of the research that we conducted to develop the fundamental movement skills assessment tool. Okay, so it was a three year study. I was funded and supported by the Youth Spot Trust to do the research to develop the assessment for them. Um, it also um, formed my PhD as well. So the study had four, there was four studies, um, four individual studies in the research program. What I really wanted to do was capture the perceptions of teachers because they would be um, the ones using the assessment. So right at the beginning, I wanted to understand how teachers wanted to assess and what they wanted that assessment to look like. OK, so it met their needs. Then for studies two and studies three, I wanted to gain expert opinion. First of all, to understand how we could balance the needs of teachers to then develop an assessment that would be valid and reliable. The third study was to generate content validity. To do that, I conducted a Delphi poll with an international group of experts, both academics and practitioners. And then the final study, once we developed the assessment, we had a, um, we'd established the, the format of the assessment and the processes within the assessment and how the teacher would use it. Um, then I, I ran a final study, which was a feasibility study to understand how teachers responded to using the assessment within their teaching. Now, so far, three of the papers um, have been published. Just the final study um, is currently in process of um, being published. So study one was really important to understand um, the needs of teachers in regards to the assessment. So the themes that emerged um, from these interviews um, based around the confidence and understanding um, of, of assessing within PE. So mentioned before that teachers have varying levels of expertise who deliver PE in primary schools. So on one hand, we've got um, experts or specialists in PE who are really confident in the subject. And that's balanced with teachers who are delivering PE who have very little training during their teacher education. Um, they don't feel confident in themselves to deliver PE. So when we're designing resources for teachers, we need to balance the different levels of confidence um, and competence of those teachers and how much understanding they have of the subject. Teachers indicated that they wanted the assessment process to be simple. Time efficiency um, was really important. 
as well as reducing paperwork. Okay. Um, teachers are very time pressured in school and they didn't want to be bogged down with having lots of um, things to look at or records to keep or to go back after the lesson and make notes on what the children have done on the assessment. So this idea of time efficient, simple and getting rid of paperwork were key. In terms of the functionality, um, we wanted to really be novel um, in how we developed the assessment tool. Um, so we really want to be driven by how the teachers um, wanted to use the assessment. So they wanted to know what they were looking for. Again, that's a little bit driven by their understanding and confidence in the subject. And they wanted the assessment to really um, power or lead within their teaching. OK, so some of the things they, want, they mentioned was to capture in um, what the children had done so they could then use that to feedback to the children. They wanted to capture, um, they wanted, sorry, they wanted demonstrations within the, the assessment as well. Um, so that, that those teachers who weren't confident in fundamental movement skills had the ability then to show children examples of the different movement skills so they weren't doing it for themselves. So what that led um, me to do was to design a storyboard really that captured the, the recommendations or the, the perceptions of teachers in how they wanted to assess. Now, what this storyboard displayed was an app. OK, so we, we took their advice around teachers advice about reducing paperwork, the ability to have videos and recording of what children had done. So I set about to develop a, an assessment which used a digital platform. So the storyboard helped with that process. And I actually created the storyboard midway through the teacher interviews. So I could show this to the late to the, um, teachers I interviewed later in, in that um, study to be guided around, OK, this works. Would you like to do this differently? How would you like the videos to be used on the platform? So the second study, um, we gained the, the, the input of experts, both academics and practitioners who were very experienced in um, assessing children's movement skills. And again, the storyboard was quite influential um, in these focus groups. We use those to, to drive and guide the discussion. Now, arising from the focus groups, we developed some practical principles um, around using digital technology to assess children's movement. So principles were based upon the time it took to set up. Again, that was driven by the short amount of time teachers have in the, in the lessons. Data recording was key. So how, what was the scoring process within that lesson? And again, that sort of links to the setup time. They, didn't, they wanted it to be just simple um, and not require any, um, any time after the lesson in regards to that data capture. The usability was key. So it having a simple process to move within the app um, and it to be intuitive. So the teacher could pick up the, the app, um, go straight into the lesson and be able to deliver the, the assessment within there without any preparation time in advance. And the video recording was key as well. Now video is seen as a really powerful tool within the assessment. Um, it allowed the teacher to record the child's movement to assess later on within that lesson, but also having that video captured means that it could be used for feedback to the child. So within that lesson, being able to show the child how they perform that movement whilst giving feedback can really help to, for that child um, to understand um, how they could move differently. So the third study was a Delphi poll. It's widely recognized that the findings of a Delphi poll generate content validity. So it was really important for us to do this to establish the, the movement skills that should go into the assessment. We used a three round Delphi poll. Um, for anyone with knowledge of Delphi polls, I'd say that our participant sample was large at, at 58. And this was um, built around academics and practitioners um, of um, experts in movement assessment, as well as teachers and practitioners using movement assessment tools. It was an international group of experts who were involved. So I'm not going to go through all the findings from the Delphi poll. I just want to pick out some of the key findings um, really from this. Um, one of which was round one, where we established which were the most important 
movement skills for teachers to assess um, children within that age of four to seven years old. And I think that's really important that we identify that it's, it's that early phase of primary school which we're focused on. Now, as we can see here, consensus agreement from the practitioners or from the participants indicated that the, within the stability group, the one foot balance was a most important skill. Within object control, um, two handed catch was most important. Interestingly, 98% of participants had that as their, their most important skill within that group. Um, and within the locomotor subgroup, running was identified as the most important skill. So the implications of this um, finding, first of all, it allowed us um, or identified the movement skills to go into the assessment. We also asked practitioners how many skills were needed within each of those subgroups to use in the assessment. Uh, there were four stability skills, five object control and five locomotor skills. So there's 14 skills in total in the assessment. Now, what else can be taken away from this is that if you're a teacher or a practitioner working with a group of children in that age range of four to seven years old, and you've only got a very small amount of time to do some um, practice or fundamental movement skills, then maybe you want to focus on the one hand, uh, sorry, on the one foot balance, the two handed catch and running as they're identified as being those most important skills for children within that age range. The second important finding that I've wanted to, to share as well is around how, um, around the scoring process within the assessment. So I spoke earlier around process and product oriented scoring. So because this was a, a novel assessment designed for teachers, I wanted to understand the scoring approach that should be used for each of the, the, the skills within the assessment. So asking the experts within the Delphi poll, um, if we look at across the graph there, we can see that the majority of skills were, um, or process oriented scoring was preferred for most of those skills. Um, so the one it wasn't really was one foot balance. A little bit uncertain why product oriented scoring came up higher just for that one skill. Potentially it's because the way the one foot balance is typically measured in existing assessments. Okay, one foot balance, if we do the stock test as an example, we typically um, measure it on the time a child can remain balanced on one leg. Also stability is not um, widely assessed in existing assessment tools. So the test of gross motor development, for example, doesn't include any movements that involve stability. Okay, there's 12 movements are comprised of, stability, of object control and locomotor movements. So because stability is, um, occurs less frequently in assessments, maybe there was more uncertainty um, within the, the expert group around to how that should be assessed. But again, I think the reason why process oriented scoring was preferred by the experts for the majority of the skills is because it's being used by teachers. So if we think back to the benefits of process oriented scoring earlier on, when we looked at the examples of the test of gross motor development, because looking at how the child performs the movement gives more feedback to the teacher to help support their learning, then it's more effective within an educational setting. So we're less focused on just understanding the competency of the child, okay, which product oriented scoring would show, but we're really driven by helping that child to develop their movement competence. So that process oriented scoring, understanding how they perform that movement is likely to be more beneficial for the teacher. So this slide um, just summarizes the groupings of the, the skills within the assessment tool. As I said before, there's four stability, five object control and five locomotor skills. Within the assessment as well, the skills are grouped within the sequential order that they should be learned. So again, the most important skills were the one foot balance, two handed catch and running. So not only did we establish the most important skills in round one, but in later rounds of the Delphi poll, the expert also um, provided consensus around the sequential order that those skills should be learned. So we can see in the locomotor group that hopping forwards 
should be learnt before skipping. Now think about the complexities of the movement of skipping. Well, that involves a hop. So a child should master a hop before they progress onto skipping. So at this point, when I was preparing the slides, I had the link to where the movement assessment tool as the app was available to download from the App, Spot, app Store and the Usport Trust website. However, in the last few days, I've gone on and I see that it's no longer available online or in the App Store. So it appears that it's currently unavailable. Um, I'm in the process of trying to find out um, if it's going to be coming back online. Um, for anyone who might be interested um, in having a look at the assessment tool or using it in the future, please do reach out to me. My email will be on the final slide as well as my uh, Twitter handle. In relation to the assessment tool, um, I would say it's a bargain when it was available at £2.49, which compared to my experience before of trying to um, get access to um, the bot two, which um, is a more than a few hundred pounds and quite hard to get hold of, um, then I feel the movement assessment tool is, is that's a real benefit um, of that assessment. So what I've got here is a couple of screen captures um, of the assessment being used just to identify some of the key features um, of how it works. So first one here, I want to focus on the usability of the assessment. As you can see, the grouping of the skills on the first page, and um, the teacher can choose which skill to use um, within that lesson. And then here, the video demonstrations or video examples provided in the platform um, show how that movement should be performed. So again, if that's a teaching tool, the teacher could use this in the classroom before going into the sports hall. They could have a projector up in the sports hall, so they're showing the movement to the children of how the movement should be performed. We also identify on here the behavioural criteria, so teaching points of, of how that movement is performed. Again, as we can see here, the catch, so the, the child here, her hands and body move towards the ball while it's in flight. I was going to progress that along a little bit. Um, again, there's instructions on how to set up the task and the assessment as well and what equipment is needed. So on the task screen itself, um, we actually recorded a, a number of children in a studio and captured children at different stages of development. So again, thinking back to um, the hourglass model presented by Gallahue, um, children at different stages of development within the fundamental movement phase. Okay, we've got children in the emerging stage, developing stage and established stage. As a teaching tool, it's quite useful because if you're a teacher with a group of children and you get them doing a warm up activity, you can make some quick observations and compare the children in your group compared to the children on these videos to do some grouping of children and make some um, quite simple and quick assessments early in the lesson. Then if we focus on the bottom right of the slide, you can see the arms, head and body. Um, so the assessment itself is um, broken down into the different components of the body. So there's criteria that drop down from each of those components um, to identify how that movement is being performed. And again, there's those three stages of development for that being emerging, developing and established with criteria for each. Our second video here, I believe this video shows the a child being scored. So again, we can see the criteria drop down to the different criteria for emerging, developing and established. You can see the simple scoring process. Um, just click on the drop down list, choose the appropriate criteria for the child you've assessed, and then it's given us a simple scoring mark on there. On the left hand side, sort of the gray box there, as you can see, um, I haven't sort of used that, that function here, um, but if you've recorded a video of the child performing that movement, that video would display there as well. So again, I mentioned earlier, some of the things teachers said they wanted to be able to do was to record a child and assess later on, then they can have the child's video on the screen on the app whilst doing the assessment. And again, that's um, having that video 
there is a, quite a powerful tool as well for, to feed back to that child after they've done the assessment. So it's a real, um, real feature there of assessment for learning to help support um, that child's um, development. And, and aside to that as well, um, for an educator, um, for a teacher who maybe wants to demonstrate progress or, or show the impact of what they've been doing in their, in their curriculum teaching, then those videos and assessment scores could then be shown to the senior leadership team in school, um, or even nicer at parents evening, it could be shared with parents. So PE, we don't typically um, capture what children are doing um, within the lessons. So parents really have no idea on how their child is progressing and the sort of things that they're doing. So it's quite nice for the teacher to be able to take the app to their parents evening and show to the, to the parents work they've been doing in PE, just like they might show um, exercise books, workbooks they've been doing in other subjects. So what I've brought us up to there is um, the beginning of study four. So that's the movement assessment tool. Okay, the final study, you wanted to understand how feasible it was for teachers to use the assessment tool. Now you might be thinking that I've ignored reliability and validity of the assessment tool. And I'm not trying to say that they're not important things to focus on because ultimately they are. Any assessment is bound by its validity and reliability. However, um, the Delphi poll is the third study did generate content validity. So we can be confident in saying that the, the assessment is measuring children's fundamental movement skills within that for that age range. Um, and reliability, yes, that is future work that needs to be done. But because this was a tool for teachers to use, then I thought, felt it was more important to assess the feasibility of the assessment being used by teachers in school. So I used Bowen's um, feasibility framework um, to, sort of, to base the, the, this final study on. So there's um, a number of eight domains within Bowen's feasibility framework, but was it demand, acceptability, um, and implementation being the first three. Okay. Um, ultimately, the response from teacher was very positive about using the assessment tool. So in regards to the demand, yeah, non-specialists were saying that it, they needed something like this. They did like that understanding of fundamental movement skills and they probably wouldn't have assessed them before, um, but having this tool did help them with that. Um, within acceptability, it was commented that it did give the teachers a better understanding of the movement skills and that they did go more in depth into how they taught those skills and the way that they looked at those skills within the lessons. Even so much as looking at the skills in isolation, which maybe they weren't doing before. They were doing more general PE delivery, maybe playing football um, or rounders, and they weren't looking at the skills in isolation as much. In regards to implementation, um, teachers um, were saying that the videos and the video and the photos um, helped um, both their, their understanding of the movement, but also helped um, the children um, to observe how those movements were being performed. And then the practicality, um, again, there were some issues around the time it was taking for teachers to use the platform initially, um, but they're, because they were just getting familiar with how the platform worked. And over the, the eight week um, trial period, the teachers did say that they were getting quicker um, at using things. So they didn't feel that would be a, a barrier over for their long term use. Um, again, the teachers commented that it was good for their CPD. Um, they were able to use it to upskill themselves and upskill other teachers. And they were actually um, one of the PE specialists were using it more widely um, with, um, his, with his school of teachers um, to help develop their understanding of fundamental movement skills. So overall, um, in regards to movement assessment tool, yes, we can confidently say that it helps teachers to, to support children's development of fundamental movement skills. Um, we haven't done any longitudinal research to look at the long-term impact on children's development of fundamental movement skills. But just from the comments that were coming out from teachers from the feasibility study, saying how it um, helped them to um, provide more instruction and practice for children's fundamental movement skills, then maybe we could hypothesize that children would um, develop 
greater competency over a period of time when the assessment is being used. But again, that is only hypothesis. It would need to be tested. Um, but what the assessment does mean is that teachers can monitor children's fundamental movement skills competency over time. Okay, So both the scoring and the assessment features, but also capturing the video as well, allow the, the teacher to monitor that. And if they're monitoring something, then they're better able to support children's development over that period of time. So more, more aware um, of where children are within their competency on fundamental movement skills. So one thing we didn't look at across the project was how the assessment is appropriate for children with special educational needs um, and inclusive practice. So it's something we're beginning to do now. We're starting to look at how the assessment could be used within an adapted learning environment and with adapted movements. So of the 14 skills, um, I wouldn't say that they're all appropriate for all children. So yes, it's not inclusive. We do need to look at that. Um, and there's work ongoing with colleagues to start looking at how children with special educational needs are assessed or can be assessed within mainstream PE. Um, the idea in there, the idea being there that currently a lot of the assessments maybe encourage ableism um, and they're not inclusive for children um, with, with special educational needs. So yeah, that is something which we are um, looking at going forwards. So ultimately, um, why is this work so important? Okay, so this slide here captures um, some recent data um, published by the school's active movement. This was um, data captured with teachers in schools around their perceptions of the current state of children's fundamental movement skills, um, health and well-being and physical activity. So this is after um, the pandemic or at this point in the pandemic, because we're not after it yet, we're still on, it's still ongoing, sadly. Um, what this highlights is that in every single one of these areas, so physical fitness, fundamental movement skills, pupils' resilience, their general well-being, the physical activity levels, um, and children's um, weight status, they are all getting worse. Now that's happened over the sort of the last 18 months. Teachers have observed these factors worsening. Okay. Now this isn't just an, a problem of today. OK, the decline in children's physical fitness um, has been going on for generations. Okay? Children of today are less physically fit than the previous generation, and those children were less physically fit than the generation before those. Okay? Fundamental movement skills. Again, we're seeing a decline in children's fundamental movement skills competency. The research, global research shows this isn't just an issue with the United Kingdom, it's, it's internationally. Um, that children aren't developing competency in fundamental movement skills. So if we go back right to the, the very beginning slides, we looked at the importance of developing fundamental movement skills. Uh, and we look again at the model um, by Studden, that if children aren't developing fundamental movement skills competency, then as they progress through childhood and into adolescence, then there's a real risk that they're going to decline and spiral into that unhealthy lifestyle, that lack of physical activity, then that can lead on to unhealthy weight status and obesity. Now, as we're seeing with the, with the pandemic, that, that has wider implications as well in terms of health-related illnesses. Now, there has been shown to be a correlation between those people with obesity and a greater risk um, with coronavirus, sadly. So that is something we need to bear in mind that if we want a healthy population, then we need to look very broadly at what we can do as academics and practitioners, being teachers and educators and those people working with children. What can we do to help reverse these declines? So based upon um, this research, and I'm not saying this is the only solution and it's not a solution in isolation, but if we can help teachers better support children's fundamental movement skills at a year, an early age. Okay, Gallagher proposed that children by the age of seven have the ability to be competent in performing fundamental movement skills. So if we can get children to that level at the age of seven and eight, then they can move on to those specialized movement skills. Okay, they're well prepared then to be um, more physically active. They have the competence 
and the confidence. They have the skills um, ready to apply in different settings and in different ways. So they can take part um, and take part and accept opportunities that arise as they get older. So we looked at the example of stability at the beginning, for example. So we saw stability in a girl walking along a beam. As she gets older, then she can go surfing, she can go skateboarding, she can um, fence. Okay, Those activities might not be available to her if she doesn't develop that fundamental movement skills competency at the early age. So what I'd like to leave you with really is a bit of a call to action. Okay, So my experience, I was a primary school teacher, I've worked in secondary schools, and I'd observed that children's movement skills weren't where they needed to be to fully engage with the PE curriculum and for them to be physically active. I then left teaching to take to carry out my PhD and to, to with my eyes was to, to make a difference. Okay. What I'd like to leave you with is a call to action um, to, to look around where you are and, and who you work with, that's academics, reach out to work with practitioners, um, teachers, people in health settings. Um, and there's a body of evidence that shows that children um, are lacking in, in their movement skills, are lacking in their um, physical fitness, have um, poor activity levels. So what can we do to help address that? Um, some of it we can achieve on our own as academics, but I think there's much more that we can do if we work collaboratively um, with teachers and look across um, other disciplines as well. So that's just a little bit of a, a call to action there for everybody um, involved. Um, like I said, my um, email and Twitter handle are on here. So if you're interested in knowing any more about the work um, I'm involved with at the moment, um, I am ongoing with this work and um, other areas of research associated to um, children's movement development, both specialised movement skills and the earlier stages of their reflexive and rudimentary movement skills, um, then please do reach out if any of that would interest you in the future. And Spencer, that brings me to an end. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Um, I like your call for action slide. Shall I start doing some press ups or something now? Is that what you'd like me to do? To do what, sorry, Spencer? Would you like me? I like your call for action slide. I said, would you like me to do some press ups or something now? Yeah, you can if you like. Perfect. For your holiday. Yeah. Perfect. Or you can wait until you're on the beach in Ireland and then you could do some. Exactly. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, very interesting. I know that we, we've started to collaborate more recently on some work with um, autistic children. So, but thanks very much for that. Uh, I'll start with a question from the chat then. Um, a question from Patricia. Um, how does the lack of these skills impact learning? You kind of touched on it within some of your, with some of your talk there. Yeah, so within the PE curriculum, so if children haven't um, developed movement skills in that early childhood or even later in childhood, so my experience um, or a key part of my experience and observations was in a secondary school whereby um, children were coming into my lesson from PE. Um, I wasn't delivering PE at that time. And I was talking to the children about what they'd done. Uh, and this lad, I remember it was quite a significant conversation. He was saying, oh, I don't really get involved in PE. I can't catch. And we've been playing rugby. So I just hang around on the touchline. I don't really do anything. And I was like, but you're 13. You've been at primary school for seven years. How have you got through primary school? And no one's taught you how to catch a ball. And for me, like for basic movements, it's in the key stage one national curriculum. Children should learn to perform basic movement skills, such as running, throwing, jumping and catching. So if a child's been unable to catch by the age of 13, what's been going wrong at primary school? Um, and I think there's a real issue there. And it is more than just providing teachers with assessments to, us, to assess children's movement skills. I think there's sort of larger things that we need to look at as well in terms of de developing teachers' knowledge and understanding across the subject. Maybe that starts in teacher education. Um, maybe that's a greater emphasis on PE as a subject. Um, so... Sorry if I've diverted a little bit from your question, but I think there's quite big implications for children. If they're not developing fundamental movement skills, then they're not able to access the, the national curriculum for PE. Uh, yeah. And that's just within the national curriculum. We look more widely around there, how children engage in physical activity outside of school. Then 
maybe that lad who can't catch a ball isn't interested when his, his friends sort of want to play some different sports or games um, on an evening or, or a weekend and he just doesn't take part. So maybe he's one of these boys who maybe he picks up something different. Not every sport involves catching a ball. Um, he might prefer swimming or riding a bike, but his range of opportunities are reduced because he hasn't developed um, competency in all of those basic movement skills. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I guess just to add to um, Patricia's question, and there's some really nice work by uh, Clay Cameron in the University of Buffalo that shows reasonably strong relationships between um, motor control um, or those motor control tasks that, in, that um, recruit vision motor, integra vision motor integration. So like, for, for example, ball catching and strong relationships with executive function and mathematics attainment in, in young kids to four-year-olds. So that's, that's quite a nice uh, avenue that we're looking, we're looking at now in um, children with autism and, and uh, autistic children and Williams syndrome. Um, uh, a question um, from Bev from the chat, Tom, um, are dyspraxic children more likely to be overweight? If we look at the model from Stodden, yeah. we could make that assumption. Um, I would need to look more into the research to accurately say, yes, they are, um, because I haven't seen that, Not because, but that's because I haven't looked specifically. So I wouldn't like to say categorically yes or no, um, but based on the model presented there, and it's not just that model, but more current research as well, I sort of looked to, to test that model. And it does show that children with um, lower levels of motor competence, um, such as those children with dyspraxia, are less physically active and do have um, an increased weight status. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, a question from Michael Thomas. Um, does a richer way of describing children's movement skills, oops, a chat just moved, sorry, uh, provide a better basis to understand possible underlying causes e.g. broad categories or deficits or broad categories of deficits or are categories more driven by sets of tasks, sports, children are required to complete? Sorry, Spencer, could you say the question again? I missed a little yeah, bit of it. There's, there's two questions. I'll, I'll just give you the first question. Um, does a richer way of describing children's movement or quantifying movement then pr provide a better basis to understand possible underlying causes, i.e. broad categories of deficits? Um, possibly, and I, I think that goes back to the, the notion of how we, how we score within the assessment. So are we using product-oriented scoring or process-oriented scoring? So I think we've had a conversation about this before, Spencer, um, when we talked about the use of the BOT2 and how it's a product-oriented score. Yeah. I mean, that's a widely used assessment um, for looking at motor deficiencies within children. Um, I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with that assessment, but it, it will indicate those who... Um, need support in their motor development. Yeah. Whereas the test of gross motor development will actually consider how children are performing that movement. Yeah. So I think the way that we score children within, a, within an assessment um, would influence how useful that is to then help them develop in that setting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think it also, sorry, sorry, a little bit to add to that, I think it also depends yeah. on the expertise of the assessor. Yep. So I think if you're very, as a very experienced teacher, I'm going to um, focus on teachers. Um, so if you're an experienced PE teacher um, and very knowledgeable about the subject and your assessment is product oriented and you capture how many times that child catches a ball, that's great for the assessment because you've also got the knowledge and understanding of the subject to then intervene and guide that child who can't catch very well yep. to improve their catch. But if you're an inexperienced teacher, who maybe isn't or doesn't have the subject knowledge around catching, then if you all you've done for your assessment is recorded how many times that child's caught the ball, yeah, the child hasn't caught the ball, but your level of understanding doesn't help you to then intervene. So maybe the process oriented scoring is a bit more rich yep. for that teacher. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think moving one step further down the quantification process. From moving, you know, moving on from the process orientated tasks that you did for teachers for ease, but we're doing some work looking at kinematic analysis and looking at specific sensory motor processes to differentiate um, different forms of uh, movement differences in, in in children, autistic children, Williams syndrome, the Down syndrome, for example. So yeah, a richer a richer method allows you to look at the underlying processes. Um, 
a question here from Kevin Campbell Davidson. Um, what evidence is there that assessment of children's fundamental movement skills is causally linked to improvements in fundamental movement skills? Uh, his intuition is that if we ring fenced an hour of outdoor free play in early years and key stage one would be more effective than assessing young children uh, more, but I have no evidence for this. So in other words, what's, is it just about assessment or allowing, allow, allowing kids to have specific forms of um, uh, practice, for example, leads to better outcomes? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because what I wouldn't like to say is that teachers should use this assessment every single lesson. Um, absolutely not. Um, the assessment should be used as part of that um, teaching cycle. Yeah. So you might assess at the beginning of a, a block of learning um, and then at the end, you might assess periodically within each term. Um, but ultimately, what the assessment does do is provide information to the teacher to inform their teaching. So if we look into the literature, the most important um, ways or the most effective ways for children to develop fundamental movement skills is to have practice and instruction yep so i think that's why the assessment is important because it helps guide that instruction yeah so yes we can set up multi-skills activities in the sports hall or outdoors for children um and it could be quite creative in how they're using that equipment but then if they haven't got the instruction to maybe adapt how they're performing some of those skills um then maybe their practice isn't as effective as what it could be without the assessment to help the teacher understand and to give that guidance. Yeah. yeah so I think exactly. it's part of that mechanism, um, but it is, only, it is only part of that mechanism. It's not the only way to help children get, get more competent. Yeah. So, so Kevin responded by saying that that makes sense, Tom. So it's, it's an instrument that allows you to assess and then you can intervene between those assessments using whatever... Yeah, absolutely. And by all, like, like I said, Kevin, I wouldn't encourage teachers to be assessing every single lesson. Yeah. Um, they could use the assessment tool every lesson because there's elements within that, such as the video demonstrations, um, yeah. that be quite, might be quite nice and useful to use with your children within the lesson. You could even have them on a big projector. I was in a school last week um, and the teacher had the projector up on the big screen with the video just playing through so the children could keep referring back as a model of how to perform that movement. Um, and they were using that as a little bit of feedback to each other. So one child was performing a skill while one child was giving some guidance and feedback. And that in itself is, is quite a rich way for that child who's giving the feedback and instruction to learn as well. Yeah, exactly, Tom. Um, thank you so much. Um, you got some uh, a lot of praise in the chat for a great talk, and I'll, I'll concur with that. So thank you very much for contributing to the SEM the seminar series, Tom. It is a couple of minutes past five. Yeah, so uh, I realised I did go over a little bit over. Uh, that's no problem at all, but thank you so much. And thank you everybody for um, listening today. We're back next week and uh, my colleague Joe will be uh, running the session um, next week. So thanks very much for that. Yes, this will be, this video will be floated on our um, SEN uh, YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Somebody else will off the chat. So thank you very much for your time. Enjoy your afternoon or evening or wherever you are. And um, on behalf of Sven, uh, good evening. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Spencer, for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for um, being here this afternoon. Thanks, Tom.